moments to touchdown. Soon the fears that most of us have about flying will be forgotten. By chance, a Mexican passenger was filming this particular journey's end in Guatemala. But what he and none of the other passengers knew was that a tropical storm had just passed over the airport. The runway is wet and the Boeing 767 is coming in too high and too fast. Incredibly, despite the terror and chaos, no one was hurt. The evacuation was successful. This was a modern plane with the very latest in safety aids. For this, the passengers can thank the work of the air crash detectives. As you can see, we're in final preparation for your flight, and we're going to do our best to make it safe and enjoyable. You can help us by paying close attention to the following safety instructions. All carry-on items must be placed completely under the seat in front of you or in an overhead compartment. Use caution in placing or removing items from the overhead bins. For most of us, the rituals of air safety pass us by. The announcement something to be endured before the drinks trolley arrives. Statistically, flying is by far the safest form of transport. There's only a one in a million chance of being involved in an accident. This is largely due to the air crash detectives whose job it is to investigate accidents to make sure they never happen again. I am a professional tin kicker. I go out there hunting down the clues and the only way to do that is to roll the wreckage over, rummage through the wreckage to see what it's gonna tell us. Well, I think that's just been a perfect way to describe the people that do this work. Airplanes are made of aluminum, and we're out there kicking it. When I go out to an accident site, and all I have is 10 acres of, of bits and pieces of airplane, my challenge is to go out there and try and put all those pieces back together again and figure out what actually happened to bring me to this place. I mean, I like going out and using my mind put the puzzle back together again. That's the challenge for me. I got the greatest job in the world. As bad as it is, I have the greatest job in the world. With more planes and more accidents, the Americans have come to be regarded as the world leaders in air crash investigation. Greg Fythe is a member of the NTSB's elite GO team on duty 24 hours a day to fly to the scene of major accidents. Arriving at an accident site is probably the most traumatic thing anybody could ever experience because you're looking at death and destruction in just magnitudes that are sometimes uncomprehendable. When you look out the window of a terminal at the airport and you see a big beautiful 747, weighs 800,000 pounds and can carry 500 people, and then you get out to an accident site and the biggest part of that airplane left is a rudder or maybe an engine and the loss of life that's involved. You, it's, it's like looking up at night, looking at the stars and wondering where it all ends. It's just, it's very hard to, to comprehend it sometimes. 
there has been a terrible air crash just northwest of Miami International Airport, a Value Jet DC-9. The Value Jet DC-9 plummeted into the alligator-infested swamps of the Florida Everglades shortly after takeoff from Miami International it's not Airport. very deep. We see people waiting out there, and it is very hard to believe that there is an airplane uh, under all of this right Where now. Where is the wreckage of this aircraft? I mean, it seems to be only just little pieces, bits and pieces. At an airport in Washington, the NTSB's elite GO team assemble. They've been called from their homes. They've no idea how long they'll be gone. From the time we got the call to the time we launched the airplane with a full team going down to Miami, it was three and a half hours, which was a very quick launch for us. This is the first time that outside cameras have been allowed to fly in with the GO team. In charge is Greg Fife, young, ambitious, and on his third major investigation. They're going to need at least one car. So the neat thing is we can call on the uh, phone line, download the uh, drawings and the systems drawings for uh, various models of airplanes, print out a paper copy on 8.5 by 11, take it off into the swamp or wherever with us, and um, then have a paper copy that you can look for this actuator or that spring and mark down serial numbers as you're walking around. So far, all they know is that a DC-9 has come down in the Florida Everglades with 110 people on board. There's a lot of adrenaline that's constantly pumping, and everyone was geared up. We know what we have to do, and we know that there's going to be a lot of assistance provided to us, but how are we going to pull this off? How are we actually going to get out there, get the wreckage, do what we have to do, and figure out what happened? And there's this silence that came over everybody because I think the thought went through the entire cabin of that airplane because we all looked out the window and we were all probably thinking the same thing. How are we going to do this? Showtime. Come over to this side, more to your left. Close to your body there. Get close to your body. It really is showtime. Being America, every NTSB investigation is carried out under the full glare of the media. It was probably the most TV equipment I have seen in a very long time at any event, probably comparable to the Super Bowl. I mean, there was cameras and trucks and everything else. As far as the eye can see, the Everglades is a featureless swamp. The DC-9 has disappeared in three feet of water. We got over the accident site, and all it was was water. Um, there were a few pieces of wreckage that were floating, and your first thought is, how far into the mud did it go, and what's it going to take to get it out of there? The area around the crash site is awash with aviation fuel and hydraulic fluid. Sweltering in their protective clothing, the local police force are ferried out to search for remains and wreckage in the alligator-infested swamp. Going to the accident site is uh, always different, but there's always the similarities. There's the smell of the fuel, if there's been a fire, there's the bad smells in airplane accidents. You get it on your boots, you get it on your clothes, you get it in your hotel room, uh, it, uh, it sticks with you. Um, you, know, you, get, you can get odors, your nose gets used to it for a while, but then it's never quite gone. You leave the room, come back in, and, you're, and it smells like an airplane accident. Somewhere in these pieces of wreckage lie the vital clues that may help the investigators unlock the mystery of Value Jet Flight 592. Greg Fyth's priority is to find the two so-called black boxes buried somewhere in the swamp. The flight data recorder contains an electronic record of what was happening to the plane, and the cockpit voice recorder tapes the pilot's voices. We used a lot of high-tech equipment, but in the long run, it was found with very low-tech equipment, that is, someone stepping on the boxes. One of the divers walked, and he was, as he was stepping along, he actually kicked something that was fairly solid and stepped on it. And when he reached down and pulled it up, he found that it was uh, one of the boxes. 
What is it? It's a flight data recorder. We got the recorder. Well, that's what we've been searching for, huh? That's one, one of them. them. One of them? That's one. The flight data recorder had received some impact damage, but for the most part, it was in good shape. But we don't want the magnetic tape to dry out. So what we do is we pack the flight data recorder in the cooler, submerged, and then make it watertight, and uh, that is now its new home for the four-hour trip to, uh, to Washington that night. In the stifling heat and humidity of the Everglades, the search for more clues goes on. Of the 110 passengers who were on board, only the remains of 65 could be identified. Blackened wreckage and singed dollar bills pointed towards a fire in the aircraft. Greg Fyth made an astonishing discovery. 144 oxygen generators were being carried here in the cargo hold of the DC-9 in breach of the regulations about hazardous cargo. They were described as empty, but they weren't. When they produce oxygen, they heat up to 500 degrees centigrade. Fyth believes that one generator ignited during takeoff started a chain reaction with the others and caused the fire that burnt through the cabin floor. After previous fires, the NTSB has recommended that fire and smoke detectors be fitted in the cargo holds of aircraft. So far, the recommendations have not been acted on. We write these recommendations. We put them forward to not only the FAA but to the industry and we get responses back saying that well, yes, we see this as a problem. However, it's an isolated case. Therefore, the economic impact that it may have does not warrant us taking action right now. We have now lost this aircraft, this value jet airplane with 110 people, presumably due to a fire in a cargo hold that had it had a detection system uh, or a suppression system may have given the flight crew some valuable time to get the airplane back to the airport. And while the accident may have occurred, it may not have been as catastrophic as it ended up being. What may have happened in the, in the last minute of flight that we don't have information for is anyone's guess. None of us were there. You can probably picture, if you were in that situation, what might be going on. And as an investigator, it's hard not to do that. What these people were experiencing, what the flight crew was trying to do. You know, each of us has its, our own um, idea of what was probably happening, but it's anyone's guess. And your imagination can run wild with what was happening in that cockpit and in that cabin, given those circumstances. On January the 13th, 1982, Washington had its worst snowstorm for decades. Government came to a halt. The city closed down. Office workers were sent home early. Not until mid-afternoon were there signs of life at Washington National Airport. It had been closed all morning to the frustration of thousands trying to escape to warmer climes. Now, passengers for Air Florida's flight Palm 90 to Miami were told to board. They were to be in the hands of a crew with little experience of bad weather. I remember before we got, finally got on the airplane that uh, I looked out there and I didn't see any evidence that the pilots had done a ground check of the airplane, which uh, I could tell because there was no footprints walking around the airplane in the snow and it never, you know, the, the, the snow still looked undisturbed. So that bothered me a little bit. Uh, I remember, I specifically remember thinking, uh, I want to see somebody walk around that airplane before I get on it. I never did see anybody walk around the airplane. Those guys were sitting fat, dumb, and happy in their cockpit and talking about the weather in Florida, as I recall, when I got on the airplane. The captain announced after we had tried a couple times to back out using uh, the tractor, 
he announced that the tractor was incapable of pulling us out by itself, but I do recall that he used some reverse thrust to try to back us out. In the snow and ice, I thought that was pretty abnormal. And as it turned out, it was, because uh, it had the effect of sucking up uh, you know, the uh, storm debris into the engines, and, and I think that I know now from reading the accident reports that that was a contributing cause to what happened to us. I didn't think we'd actually get airborne, but I could feel us lift off the runway. The shaker was going, I could hear the dishes coming out of the galley all over everywhere, and I knew we were in deep shit. When we hit the bridge, it was kind of, uh, kind of like, uh, being rear-ended on a freeway, and I said, Jesus, I've, I survived that. And then I realized I was still heavily in motion, and the next thing I know, and we were tumbling, it seemed like. And then we hit something that was, seemed like a hundred times harder than that first hit, uh, which had to be hitting the river. And, uh, and I blacked out, and as I was blacking out, um, I just figured that was it, you know, so I just, uh, my last thought, was God help me. Oh my fucking God. Holy shit. The plane had hit the 14th Street Bridge over the River Potomac, the main route into Washington from the suburbs of Virginia. Several cars had been crushed by the plane's undercarriage. The dark in that airplane, it was absolutely pitch, pitch, pitch black. I remember it settling onto the ground or onto the bottom of the river before I could get my legs free. And I remember swimming out over the top of the seats toward the back of the airplane. I knew I was out of the airplane um, when, the, when the light and the water turned from absolute black to sort of gray. And the contrast between having been in a nice hot airplane about one minute earlier, or maybe five minutes earlier, whatever it was, and where I suddenly found myself was just phenomenal. I mean, it just, <laughs> the airplane was gone. Everything was gone. Seventy-five people died aboard Air Florida's Palm 90 that day in the heart of Washington, less than a mile from the White House. Despite all the people and all the technology, only five passengers could be saved from the freezing river. Flight attendant Kelly Duncan. Joe Stiley's secretary, Nikki. She would be rescued later by a Park Service helicopter. Joe Stiley and Priscilla Tirado, who had left her baby and her husband behind in the plane. Priscilla Tirado is temporarily blinded by the spilled kerosene in the river. Passerby, Lenny Skucknick, can watch no more. He dives in and saves Priscilla Tirado's life. Everybody get behind the fire truck. Get behind the fire truck, all right? Investigators of the National Transportation Safety Board, America's air crash detectives, now focused their attention on the wreckage. If anything, it served only to deepen the mystery. There seemed to be no mechanical problems, so why had the plane pitched into the river? True, weather conditions had been bad, 
but other aircraft had been taking off normally. Why not Palm 90? It was the eventual discovery of the cockpit voice recorder that was to provide the answer. The last seconds of this 30-minute audio tape echoed the desperation of the pilots as they realized they were not going to make it. Mike McDermott is an independent air accident investigator, a specialist in CVRs, cockpit voice recordings. The CVR indicates the general attitude of the crew as being one of disguised concern. There's a lot of joking around, you hear a lot of laughing, but the joking seems to be as a way of coping with the difficulty of the situation. Their nervousness in flying in snow may be due to their lack of experience. Um, there are instances uh, where they indicate the fact that the de-icing doesn't quite uh, help them. They also indicate um, and when they're going through their checklist and they're planning for the actual takeoff, they're talking about what they will do. Uh, how they will take off, they will apply power, they'll let the nose wheel come off the ground, fly to 500 feet, reduce the power. Uh, and their last comment is to uh, reduce it to a certain level depending on their level of comfort or, as they say, how scared we are. So I think they were very nervous about the situation. They knew that they were heavy. They had a lot of passengers and a lot of weight on board and the snow only added to their weight, and that caused them some concern. But why had the plane failed to take off? By analyzing the engine noise heard on the tape, investigators discovered that the pilot had never applied full power, even when the plane was about to drop out of the sky. Unbelievable as it might seem, when the crew were running through their pre-flight checklist, for some reason they had neglected to switch on the anti-icing equipment. That became a very, very controversial issue when we listened to the uh, cockpit voice recorder and they went through the checklist and they said engine and the ice and they said off, but nobody wanted to believe that, that they said off. Why would they say off? And uh, there was so much disagreement uh, later on uh, as the investigation progressed that uh, the tape was again reviewed, I think, by the FBI lab and, and voice, uh, voice analysis and some people just said, no, it can't be off, it's got to be on. Did he say on or off? Was the anti-icing switched on or not? Today's sophisticated sound equipment can clear up the mystery once and for all. McDermott simply extracts the co-pilot's response from the previous item in the checklist, the word on. Alongside it, he places the suspect word, which he calls onf. And after you've listened to this for hours, literally hours on end, um, I think it becomes very apparent that the second word is actually off. The definitive judgment was that the word was off. In the freezing cold, the crew had apparently forgotten to switch on the plane's anti-icing equipment, an incredible blunder. And when the captain made his unorthodox attempt to get the plane off the ramp by using reverse thrust, he had choked the engines with ice and snow. The probes that tell the pilots their engine power had frozen, giving the crew false readings, and they mistakenly believed they were taking off at full power. The co-pilot apparently understood what was happening, and he, and he desperately tried to tell the captain until the very last minute that it doesn't look right, and the captain simply didn't respond to it. Now you hear that whine, that's the, the application of power. You hear them talking about their engine instruments, say this is cold, this is real cold. 
Because it doesn't seem right. No, it's not right. It's the same guy. There's, no, I don't think that's right. You can, he's, he's really concerned about this and it's not performing right. He sort of resigns himself to it and says, yeah, well, maybe it is. Okay, at this point, they've lifted the nose off the ground and they're flying. You hear the stick shaker, the da 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 da, -da sound, indicating that they're not flying fast enough. They're about to stall the, the wing of the aircraft. And the pilot is saying, forward, forward, we only need 500 feet. That was the sound of the impact. As passengers, most of us have managed to suspend our disbelief in flying. But at rare moments, our vulnerability is brought home to us in a horrifying way. A sudden encounter with air turbulence can leave even experienced passengers screaming, petrified, white-knuckled. It has a somewhat more measured effect on air traffic controllers, but even so, you can still see the whites of their eyes when turbulence descends upon an airport. They may have to divert flights, close runways, even close the airport. You got anybody behind us? Who's that, 720? Hey, Dale, the last one, uh, 327, just off of 17 left in the 35 complex of Jersey, now the most of the time, Southgate. The Northgate no, no, no. is We're closed currently, but we don't expect that to last for more than uh, about 15 minutes. Hello? In a yeah. minute. Many crashes for which pilots were blamed are now thought to have been caused by air turbulence. Only in the 1970s, after a series of appalling accidents, was the most lethal turbulence recognized and given a name, wind shear. And its most deadly form is called a microburst. A microburst is likened to a high pressure air hose pointed at the ground. As the air hits the ground, it bounces upward and outward in every direction. Eleven years ago, the full horrors of a microburst were visited upon this airport Dallas-Fort Worth in Texas, the second biggest in the world. August the 2nd, 1985 was a day I'll never forget. It was uh, your typical Texas day. Beautiful weather, you couldn't have asked for a more perfect day. And uh, when we finished uh, cleaning the trucks for that day and put them up in the stalls for the, for the next emergency call, uh, we're preparing our evening meal and uh, it's just before six o'clock. Uh, there's a weather warning comes on. The weatherman says uh, we've got a severe weather sale at the north end of DFW Airport. And uh, we're all looking at each other, knowing what we just came out of, how beautiful it was, and we're saying, this guy's got to be crazy. For the next 30 minutes, Dallas Airport was to experience extraordinary scenes as the full fury of nature was unleashed upon it. This is a very strong rain shower. Boy, you can see the thunderstorm over there on the horizon, but I think everything is fine. A little bouncy today, but no problem. Oh yes, everything looks fine. Checklist is complete and we have been cleared to land. Charlie Phipps, a Delta Airlines training captain, flies the Dallas approach. His simulator has been programmed with exactly the same conditions that his colleagues on Delta Flight 191 encountered that day, taken from the flight recorder of the ill-fated TriStar. A little bit more turbulence than I expected. Glide slope, we're coming up on the glide slope again. Everything is fine. Seems like we're losing some, we're, we're losing some Air speed, the tailwind, yes, we got a tailwind now, a strong tailwind. Oh, yes. Before we ran into the storm, 
you can hear everybody on the plane laughing and cutting up and, uh, you know, just idle chatter. But as we got into the storm more and more, the plane got quieter and quieter. And finally, there was, you know, you could hear a pin, pin drop in the plane. Wow, look at the tailwind. We've got a heck of a tailwind here. Oh, my God. Come on, come on, airplane. Come on, come on. Come on, fly, baby. Come on, come on, baby. You can make it. You can make it. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, baby. Come on, come on. Come on. The plane touched down in a field, engines screaming at full power, careered across a freeway, snapping off lamppost, bounced down upon a car, killing its occupant. Then it entered the airfield, heading at full speed, not for the runway, but to one side of it, heading for two four million gallon water tanks. The ride really got rougher. And when we hit the we hit the first water tire, nobody knew what we hit. And it was only a few seconds after that, tenths of seconds, we hit the second water tire. And that's when all the debris and the fire came back up the left side of the plane. And that's when I ducked my head. And you really didn't know what to do. I just knew I didn't want to get I didn't want to die. I don't know how long I sat in my chair after the plane finally came to a rest and everything, but I noticed there was only two people left in the plane, maybe three, besides myself. And the plane was didn't have no middle section. All the middle seats were gone. And about that time, you could hear the sirens going off. The eight, first day was coming to us. The rain was so hard that I couldn't see past my windshield. The rain and the wind was holding the uh, windshield wipers back. They, they wouldn't even wipe the windshield. I tried to roll the window down to see. It was like somebody standing outside with a bucket of water hitting me in the face with it. It was just, it was that bad. As I approached the crash scene then and actually got to the, to the tanks, uh, I was not ready for what I saw. I, through all my years of training, uh, fi firefighters training, I really expected to see an aircraft sitting there on the ground, but there was no aircraft. It was just pieces of an aircraft. We had four million gallons of water pouring out of those tanks, and uh, when I got out of the vehicle, uh, the water was actually almost to my chin. It was that deep, and I could see the debris from this aircraft, you know, looming out of the water and uh, fire and smoke and fuel burning on the water and, and uh, I could actually see bodies burning and uh, it was just, just a tremendous sight. 137 people died at Dallas. The NTSB completed its report but for once it failed to agree with its own investigator. Rudy Kapustin retired before the investigation was complete and his report was finished by others. To this day, he disagrees with its findings, that the crew were mainly to blame. The crew, I, I, I think, you know, when you, when you try to evaluate, did the crew do, do the right thing and do the wrong thing? Well, in retrospect, obviously, they did the wrong thing because they crashed. You can't say they did the right thing. But did they act prudently based on what they knew and continuing the approach? based on what they knew at the time, I would say yes. Lightning coming out of that one. What? Lightning coming out of that one. Yeah. Go ahead. The members of the board criticized the pilots for flying through a thunderstorm and attempting to land. On this computerized animation, reconstructed from the plane's own flight recorders, the black column that the plane is approaching is the microburst. But the pilots had been told that there was just a little rainstorm and that other planes were landing safely. But there's always a reluctance, particularly if someone lands just in front of you. There's everybody will say, you know, uh, American or, or TWH is landing, how come you couldn't land? The passengers will do that. They don't like to be late. Push it up. Push it way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. 
The consequences of that reluctance can be heard on the plane's cockpit voice recording. The, the air traffic centers, air route traffic control centers, have a meteorologist ever since, or because of some weather involved accidents some years ago, had uh, meteorologists assigned, well, I think the one at, at DFW center, he wasn't there. The, the backup weather facility wasn't functioning. Another one that was a backup facility for that. So in, in reality, real time, weather was never disseminated to that flight crew. And I was gone from the board when the, when the report was adopted, and I, I had serious disagreements with the report because uh, air traffic was just pretty much left out of the cause. And uh, that, that, I don't think, was a, was a fair assessment of what, what caused that particular accident. They pretty much, pretty much left it all with the crew. Uh, based on the fact that one of the uh, one of the crew members said, uh, "Yeah, there's lightning in it." They knew there was weather up there, and they said, "Yeah, there was lightning in it." Well, you don't know where that lightning was in relation, uh, you know, to their position. And also during the litigation, probably the first time—I don't know if it was the first time or not—but there was video animation was used to portray this flight going in, and it showed the lightning. But that's, you know, that's a little bit of Mickey Mouse, you know, I mean, you can put the lightning anywhere as you want to on an animation. And, of course, uh, the government got off scot-free in the litigation, too. But, but that's what happens. I think that's how, uh, when it gets to litigation, I think whoever is, tells the most convincing story, uh, right or wrong, wins. You know, that's, I, I, I wasn't very happy about that. the island of Tenerife in the Canaries. Its beaches are a favorite haunt of sun-starved holidaymakers from all over Northern Europe. Way above these beaches, literally up in the clouds, is Tenerife's Los Rodeos Airport, now little used since it became the most notorious airport in the world. A thousand people lost their lives here in accidents much of it due to the fact that Los Rodeos is shrouded in clouds on most days. Sunday, March the 27th, 1977, was just such a day. Flying to the Canaries were two jumbo jets, Boeing 747s. Both were charter flights, one a Pan American plane full of tourists, the other a Dutch jet belonging to KLM Airlines. One of the many strange things about that day was that neither pilot had set out for Tenerife. We were starting our descent for the approach and landing at uh, Las Palmas, our original destination. And as we were doing that, we got a call from air traffic control to divert immediately to Tenerife. A terrorist bomb on the next island had caused this small airport to suddenly become choked with planes. Bob Bragg was the co-pilot on the Pan Am Jumbo. It's the first time he's been back to Los Rodeos since that Sunday in 1977. Twenty years later, bits of his plane are still all around. When we landed here, the entire ramp was completely and totally congested. There were probably 20 to 30 airplanes that had also diverted and were parked here, which necessitated us having to go way down to the end here and park. By now, there are 400 people who've been up all night, uh, half the day before, possibly, and they don't quite understand what's going on. And our information was certainly limited at that point. We really didn't know the circumstances or what, was, what had actually transpired. The um, facilities on board, I suppose, by now were a little, um, well, it was busy, let me put it that way. And everybody was restless. 
The Dutch pilot, Captain van Zanten, was getting restless too. His plane had been parked alongside the Pan Am, and the American pilots could hear him constantly on the radio, anxious to be on his way before he ran out of flying hours. He was very irritated about the situation, as I'm sure all of us were, because most of us had uh, been flying all night long, and uh, we were all anxious to get to our destination. Uh, Basically, about that time, he decided to start refueling. Concurrent with that, they opened up the airport at Las Palmas. So the engineer and I got out and walked and measured the wingtip clearance between the KLM 747 and our 747. And we found out that we were about 12 feet short of being able to get around him and taxi out. So we had to wait for the KLM airplane to refuel. The two aircraft had been parked at the wrong end of the runway for takeoff. And with so many planes choking the airport, the only way they could get to the correct end was by taxiing up the runway itself. This simulation recreates the acknowledged facts of the accident. Air traffic control ordered the KLM to go first and wait when it got to the far end. The Pan Am would follow behind but would turn off the runway about three quarters of the way along to allow the KLM to take off. By the time we got the clearance that we were going to leave and take off, uh, people were very happy by then. They were quite elated. These were uh, people who were going to meet a cruise ship in the Canary Islands and cruise around the Mediterranean. And uh, a lot of them were senior citizens uh, that had come from uh, California. As the Pan Am entered the runway in its turn, clouds began to roll down from the surrounding hills. The American pilots soon found themselves crawling through the dense mist looking for their turn-off. By now the KLM plane had already reached the far end, turned and was anxious to be on its way. The tower called us and asked were we off the runway and I said negative, we're still on the runway but we will report clear of the runway. We looked up and we saw the KLM airplane's lights uh, and I immediately saw the lights shaking and I said, I think he's moving. And uh, then I, it was very obvious that he was moving. So I started yelling, get off, get off. And the captain turned the airplane, went to full power on the throttles. As we were turning, I looked back out of the right window and uh, couldn't believe it that he was doing what he was doing. And I'll never forget, I saw the rotating beacon uh, underneath the belly of the airplane. I closed my eyes and ducked. And I didn't even think he'd done us any damage. It was very little noise, uh, very little shaking or anything. I, I was just very, very aware of things in, in slow motion and, and everything was flying around and all of a sudden everything settled and nothing looked like it had before. I didn't see anything I recognized, I, there were no people around. It looked like someone had taken a big knife and just sliced the entire top of the airplane off. I could see all the way to the tail of the airplane. So I reached down to try to shut off the engines with the start levers, which controls the fuel to the engines. Uh, that didn't do any good. Obviously all the controls were severed. Then I reached up to get the fire control handles, which is up top, which shuts the engines down. And that's when I discovered that the top of the cockpit was gone. I looked around, there was no side of the cockpit left, so I stood up and elected to jump over the side, which was about 48 feet. Dorothy Kelly found herself in the cargo hold, but managed to clamber to the top of the blazing plane. Uh, I looked over the side, and it was like looking out of the second floor window from my house, uh, with nothing but jagged metal, and my thought was, by now I had lost my shoes. I've, survive this and I'm going to kill myself jumping out of here on all that debris down there. Dorothy Kelly jumped from the blazing plane, breaking an arm and fracturing her skull. She became the heroine of the crash, rescuing the captain, tending the passengers. People were lying all over the field, hurt, uh, certainly bloody, very, very badly injured. Uh, one thing I remember in particular, there was a man who had his clothes almost completely blown off him. He was just uh, wandering around in a daze, and I remember I kept trying to push him off to the side and get him away, and he would just keep coming right back into all the action. 
people were just banging in at the windows and shouting. I mean, you could hear shouts, screams from inside. And that was probably my most vivid memory. And, and the, what has hurt the most through all those years is remembering all those people and hearing them scream and realizing that they were, they were being burned and they were not not going to get out because there was no way we could get to them. Tenerife remains the world's worst ever air disaster. 583 people died. Everyone aboard the KLM plane, which was completely burnt out on the runway, all but 77 of the Pan Am passengers. Today, this is all that is left of Pan American Airlines. The company itself crashed in 1992. Paul Roish, one of its senior captains, managed to save the corporate records from a skip. Amongst them were the charred instruments from the Tenerife accident. Roish was one of the official American investigators who arrived in Tenerife next day. As the investigators gathered, their first task was to listen to radio messages between the air traffic control tower and the two planes. Roish heard something that grabbed his attention right away. There was a, a point at which you, you could not tell what the uh, KLM first officer was saying. And we asked that that be played over several times. Uh, it was obvious that the, the man was under stress. Uh, his voice changed its, its uh, timber. It became tremulous. It was slightly shaky. And, and his words were blurted out rather than spoken clearly. And that's what, that was a benchmark, that caught our attention right away. I believe that the first officer's voice changed because he saw something happening in the cockpit that shouldn't be happening. But it was the cockpit voice recorders from the two burnt out planes that were to provide the answer to the mystery. As the KLM plane reached the end of the runway and turned, Captain Van Zanten immediately began to push up the throttles to take off. First officer said, no, wait a minute, we don't have our air traffic control clearance. The captain said, yes, I know that. He pulled the throttles back. Now go ahead and call for it. The controller gave them their air traffic control clearance, which tells them what route they must follow. Then they were supposed to ask for permission for the takeoff itself, but they never got that far. As the first officer was reading the clearance back to the controllers, the captain again commenced the takeoff. He pushed the throttles up. He said, we go. The aircraft started to roll. The first officer sensed that this was not right. He, he knew that they hadn't been cleared for takeoff. And so he blurted out, and we are taken off, or we are at takeoff. It wasn't even that clear. The words are difficult to comprehend, and the tenor of the voice changes. Uh, it's obviously very tense. But he felt that he had done his part in, in letting people know that they were commencing their takeoff. All this time, the Dutch airplane was accelerating down the runway. The flight engineer in the Dutch cockpit heard the words from the Pan Am airplane saying, uh, Roger will advise when we're clear, and he questioned the, uh, the captain and the first officer. He, he said, then, is he not clear then, and the Pan American? And both crew members said, yeah, yeah, he's clear. At that point, they were just entering the heavy cloud. They saw the, the Pan Am aircraft desperately trying to get off the runway, but it was not in time. The, uh, the rest is history. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Under international regulations, the investigation was conducted by the Spanish, but with both the Americans and Dutch allowed to participate. That's the cell call. Where is that located? Cell call computer, and I'm trying to think where that is now. That is in, a, in that area as well. Soon there was a split amongst the investigators. And uh, the fuel flow check. The Dutch were, in my opinion, searching for, for something to fasten onto that would divert the 
the blame from, from their own uh, countrymen. Mainly, I believe, they tried to pin the, the blame on the air traffic controllers. Uh, to some extent, they tried to pin the blame on, on uh, the Pan Am crew. The stakes were high, not only the reputation of KLM, but of their most famous captain, Jacob van Zanten, the man whose face stared out of the KLM adverts. Captain Van Zanten was a pilot of great prestige in KLM. Uh, he was uh, a top instructor pilot. Uh, in fact, he was so well regarded in KLM that <clears throat> it's my understanding uh, when the Dutch officials or the KLM officials first heard about this accident, they tried to find Van Zanten to ask him to come down and, and uh, be part of the investigation team. Unfortunately, of course, he wasn't available. The Spanish report found that the accident had been caused by the Dutch captain taking off without clearance, a basic error caused by his anxiety to get on his way. But a Dutch board of inquiry absolved Captain van Zanten of any blame, saying there had been a simple misunderstanding with air traffic control. The pilot thought he had his clearance. Paul Roish believes that van Zanten's personality was at the heart of the accident. He was a difficult man to, to, uh, to contradict, uh, especially for a, a junior uh, pilot such as the first officer on this flight. He did have the, uh, the courage to, to uh, stop him once when, when the captain first started the throttles up, but I don't think he felt he could get away with it again. July the 19th, 1989. A United Airlines DC-10 leaves Denver Airport, bound for Chicago and Philadelphia, with 285 passengers on board. Sitting in first class, catching a ride home to Chicago, was a United Airlines senior DC-10 captain, Denny Fitch. We were at 37,000 feet. Uh, it was a lunch flight, and after lunch had been served, and a cup of coffee was placed in front of me. And, uh, and at that time, they took that opportunity to turn the uh, short subject on to watch. And very shortly after that time frame, there was a loud, muffled explosion. It wasn't that subtle thing, it was very abrupt and very loud. It was not long after uh, Pan Am 103 was downed over Scotland by a terrorist bomb, and I thought, a bomb has gone off, and uh, we're, all gonna, we're all gonna perish at this point. I never even gave it a second thought. I just sat down on the floor and held on because I didn't know what it was. I was kind of sitting sideways in the seat and had a cup of coffee in my hand. And when, as soon as the engine blew, we had the explosion, Bill grabbed the controls. So, okay, that's taken care of it. He's gonna fly the airplane. At first, it seemed to be an engine failure. Unusual, but an event that all pilots train for. To lose an engine in a commercial airplane, probably that's the most trained maneuver we do in our simulators for emergency practice. And I know that our pilots are extremely proficient at operating in this fashion if it becomes necessary. And it wasn't because of that confidence in the pilots. You don't run to help. It's not necessary. They're trained for it. I've never lost a jet engine in flight. I've been flying jets since 1968, never had an engine fail. But still, through the training we had, you just follow the procedure. And the procedure is, he flies the airplane, and we shut the engine down. And so that's what we started to do. And while we're in that process, then we begin to realize that the situation was worse than we thought. As the aircraft appeared to be out of control, Denny Fitch offered his help to the captain, Al Haynes. When I looked forward, I looked over the engineer's shoulder, and on the panel where they keep all the hydraulic equipment or, or gauges for it, uh, we have three hydraulic systems that are in the aircraft main systems, and all three quantity gauges and all three pressure gauges were indicating zero. Now, that's, a, that's an occasion you will only see on the ground at the gate with the engine shut down. The first officer and the captain were both pushing 
on the control yoke trying to get the nose down because it was climbing and they wanted to get the nose down. And they pushed full forward and I can distinctly remember the first officer slouched in his seat with his knee placed firmly under the control column to put even more leverage on the forward moment of it and it wasn't affecting it at all. When we fly airplanes and we want to make a turn, the device is looking from behind their ailerons, and these are located here, and they're flippers. They come up and down as necessary. But in all cases in a normal aircraft, if this one comes up to put this wing down, and this one goes the opposite direction, down to assist it. So they always work opposite each other. If one goes up, the one on this side goes down. If this goes up, then this one goes down. When I looked at it, these two ailerons in these two locations were both floating up in the same direction at the same time. And that is that was distinctly not normal and obviously a confirmation of what we saw in the cockpit. Unlock that fucking door. Unlock it. Pull back, pull back. No, we have no hydraulic fluid. That's part of our main problem. Both your inboard ailerons are sticking up. That's more than I can tell. I don't know that's a Well, that's because we're, steer we're, we're turning maximum return. Yeah. So I have to be steering the airplane. Okay, you're that's good. Right. Okay. Right. Go ahead and help. Just don't worry tell about it. Me, yell what you want. I'll, I'll help you. Right. Our code one put to a... What we need is some elevator control, and I don't know how to get it. Danny Fitch thought it might be possible to maneuver the DC-10 using engine thrust. If I wanted to go to the right, I'd reduce thrust on this engine, increase thrust on this engine, and by pushing harder on this side, the airplane would tend to go this way. Of course, the opposite was the problem. Our airplane wanted to go right all the time, and we didn't want it to. So I had to keep more power on this engine and less on this engine just to counteract this tendency to want to go this way. I was trying to keep the wings level. As well as wanting to bank to the right, the aircraft was lunging through the sky in what's called a fugoid. The airplane would go in like in a sine wave. It would climb, change direction, descend, then it would climb. And those magnitudes of those efforts up and down would be at 2,500 feet per minute on average. And the cycle seemed to operate at about a minute apart. So you'd finish one at the top and then it would start down. And then you get to the bottom after a minute and it would go back up again. As Denny Fitch managed to control the direction of the aircraft, the crew found themselves heading for the small town of Sioux City, Iowa. United 232, Sioux City. Well, we have no hydraulic fluid, which means we have no elevator control, uh, almost done, and very little aileron control. I have serious doubts about making the airport. He was about 40 miles northeast of Sioux City, which is just farmland out there and uh, he was just making big right 360s, losing altitude the whole time. He, the plane was totally uncontrollable at this point. And, uh, you know, I was talking to him in between our conversations, our transmissions. You know, I told my supervisor, you know, 300 people are going to die and there's nothing we can do about it because you know, it was obvious, I mean, that they were going down. Well, we have almost no control here. We have no idea. We're going to go to Sioux City and we're going to try and put it into Sioux City, Iowa. Well, we're going to have the gear down, and if we can keep the airplane on the ground and it stops standing up, give it a second or two before you back up. We're going to be We're going to have 1,500 back up before. Brace. The brace will be the signal. It'll be over the PA system. Brace, brace, brace. And then if we have to evacuate, you'll get the command signal to evacuate, but I really have my doubts will be in. Stand it up, buddy. Good luck, sweetheart. Okay. Lock up and put everything away. Shit, there goes the slats. But for the most part, you know, they were calm, collected, which, considering what was going on, was unbelievable. There was no panic. It just, you know, I don't think we, we knew enough to, to panic. Uh, we just, we were just trying to keep the airplane flying. It's, it's so hard to explain because everybody pictures all kinds of things going on in their mind. And it was just, what is the next step to keep this airplane in the sky? And why is it in the sky? 
if a situation was the way it was supposed to be, we shouldn't be in the sky. It's a corny adage, but I, I think your attitude determines your altitude. And if you think you can't, then you won't. And uh, I believed with my whole heart we were going to pull this off. I really did. His wheels were down, his nose were up, his wings were level. It looked like it was going to be just a fast landing. You know, he'd roll off to the end of the runway to evacuate the aircraft. And I really thought we'd all be home for supper that night. I really didn't think. Of course, it doesn't happen in your town. It doesn't happen to you. At the end of the runway, it's just a wide open field post. Somewhere around 400 feet above the ground, and we're going so fast, the captain said, pull the power off, meaning let's get rid of some of the speed. And I said, I can't. That's what's holding your wing up. Let's turn. Let's turn. I looked down at the captain's vertical speed indicator, and I saw it at 1,800 feet per minute, which was intolerable. We couldn't hit that hard. And in a desperate effort, I firewalled both the engine, shoved both the throttles up to full power, and the time factor wasn't there for us. saw the airplane on final and it's like man he's gonna make it and uh, I mean everybody was just stunned when it hit I mean we couldn't believe it, it was it was like slow motion I mean, the plane was probably going 220 knots and you know we knew we were gonna, it was gonna hit hard but we expected him to make it for 30 minutes I built up inside me this wall saying all these people are gonna die and then all of a sudden they're all gonna live and then think again, suddenly they're all gonna die again. And I just felt like my heart had been ripped out. We just dropped out of the sky and hit the ground. I mean, it, it felt like we slammed into the earth. And immediately, I mean, within seconds after the initial impact, I saw flames, I saw smoke, I saw people still strapped in their chairs being thrown around in the cabins, people thrown out of their chairs being thrown around the cabin. And uh, I mean, within a few seconds, there was a lot of chaos, there was a lot of destruction, and there was probably some death uh, immediately upon that impact. I saw the corn stalks going by Captain Haines' window. And the strangest thought crossed my mind is, my God, they really do grow up that tall in Iowa. And of course, the bad news was that a normal DC-10 captain sits 22 feet in the air. And I know they didn't grow it that tall. So I knew that something bad had probably happened to our undercarriage or our landing gear. I remember tearing of metal. I remember now very loud shrieking engine noise. Noises that that you've never heard before and you hope you never hear again. It was horrendous. The, these strange, sh shrieking noises. When we went straight ahead for a period of time and then we veered to the right into a soybean field. And uh, it's almost as if somebody had kicked you from behind and you could feel your body, your whole body went forward as if you were going over the top. When we started to go over, uh, I was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I know this airplane is starting to roll. I felt heat, humidity, and debris. And after that, it was just one of the most, I can't begin to describe in words how violent it was after that. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't smell anything. Nothing was working except my mind. Uh, it was like total body detachment or, or being in a protective cocoon. Um, I then realized that two-thirds of me was suspended in fire, and I felt this is, this is it. This is how I'm going to go on. This is how I'm going to die. And it was uh, the most incredibly peaceful moment I've ever known, that uh, I was in no pain. I had no fear anymore. It was total peace.
I opened my eyes and I couldn't recognize a thing. It was like waking up on a foreign planet. I was thinking, I'm still thinking. In other words, I'm still alive. And then it was right back to work. Um, we've got to get out of here. There goes life like that. Behind me, I heard someone say, there's an opening. I immediately went back where I had heard that voice, and surely enough, people were walking out into a cornfield. It was surreal. I could have been saying, thank you very much for flying with us today. And they were going slowly, and in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, this could blow up at any minute. I wish they'd move faster. We're taught that when the fire is too hot, this water's too deep and the smoke is too thick that you leave. So there was no question of me going in to, to look for anyone else because it was deadly. I, I, that's when I left. The seriously injured were separated from the walking wounded. There was no trace of the flight crew. They didn't find us for 30 minutes because the thing was such a big mess that they didn't think it was an occupied portion of the airplane. They thought it was the avionics compartment where all the radio gear was because all you could see are wires and cables. We came to rest inverted and uh, our second officer in his position had a hole. He was able to get a hand up and put a little bit of insulation in the air and he kept waving it and finally after about 30 minutes uh, one of the rescuers saw the hand, saw the, saw the insulation, came over in his truck to look into it and he was informed by our second officer that there was four pilots in here, this was the cockpit. When you see the, the wreckage of the cockpit, yes, it's a miracle we got out of there. It's a miracle any of us survived. And we had passengers come off of that airplane without a scratch on them. No. Out of 285 passengers, 184 survived the Sioux City crash. I was told that I was touch and go for quite a bit of time during the night. Uh, the next morning, my wife and child came over, my youngest child came over, and uh, when she came into intensive care, uh, I asked her two questions, and uh, I said, did I make the runway? And uh, she said, yeah you, yeah, you made the runway, because I knew our salvation was there. That's where the equipment was, and if we were going to live, we had to make the runway, so it meant everything to me. And the second question I asked her, I said, is everybody else okay? And she started to cry, her eyes filled with tears, and she, I had my answer. And I think I cried for three days on and off. I just, it was just terrible. It was, the survivor's guilt was incredibly bad. I really wanted to die so that they could live. I would make, make the trade with God so they would survive. It meant everything to me, and uh, it just wasn't to be, I can't play God, I guess. The wreckage was spread out all over the airport for probably the better part of three quarters of a mile. And the airport was uh, covered with crops in the growing areas. Consequently, the wreckage was embedded in a cornfield, which was a bit surprising for us. We just had not thought about that for an airport situation. And we were able to immediately see the uh, initial impact points of the, uh, of the aircraft at the end of the, uh, the closed runway where it landed and uh, follow up to, to where the cockpit uh, section was and up to the tail section and then this large section of fuselage that was over on the side. Now this is what we call a, a core engine. Then up in front, I told you to look at that fan up at the other engine and I took this and pointed at it and said, you're gonna see what's missing now. That whole fan area is missing. That whole damn fan area. And this is a, a large, large piece of, of equipment. And when it goes, if it's spinning at a, at a high RPM, it's got a, it's got a kinetic energy that's, that's really something. It's really something. Nobody's going to solve an accident in the first 30 minutes or, or the first day. Consequently, sticking with the uh, rules of investigation means that you count all four corners of the airplane and you look for all the ground scars you can find. The investigators knew very early on that the tail engine's fan disc had disintegrated and spun out and sent shrapnel through the tailplane. 
the hydraulic lines were severed, the flight controls useless. But they didn't know why, and they couldn't find the fan disk. As the accident unfolded, it became obvious that the fan disk in the number two engine was missing. And also it was known that the hydraulic systems were damaged and things of that nature. So uh, it became a giant search to try to find uh, the, these disc pieces, and they're large. The disc itself is a 300 pound uh, titanium forging. And on top of that, there are these fan blades that stick out, and the whole thing is very big, very heavy. Uh, so these pieces, you would think, when they fell to earth, they would be obvious and that you would walk up and find them. But with the Iowa cornfields stretching for miles on end, uh, no one could find them. They did aerial searches and all types of things. They had jet planes flying over with radar looking for it. And there was jets flying over this area right above the corn, big jets. Three months after the crash, Janice Sorensen found the vital clue as she was combining her corn. I just backed the combine up, then I could see some of the blades protruding out, and uh, I started crying <laughs> because I knew how important it was. Uh, one more. <laughs> this was the whole, oh. I came on the combine, and the combine met with resistance and backed up, and I thought, oh, my gosh, this is it. This is it. I couldn't believe it. So I came to the house. Dad had gone to town with a load of corn, and um, then I called the sheriff's office and talked to Jerry Clark and told him, and he said, did you really find it? And I said, yes. And he knew I was really emotionally upset, so he said, take a Valium and sit down, and we'll be right out. The broken fan disc, similar to this new one, was examined by the NTSB's senior metallurgist, Jim Wildy. In order to find out how the fan disc broke, it's simply a fractographic examination. That means looking at the fracture surface, trying to find the details of the fracture that, that lead an investigator uh, or an experienced eye to follow the features back to an origin area. On the fan disc, the features were very easy to read. There was a radiating pattern that stemmed or emanated right from the bore of the disc, the hub portion of it. And uh, in that area, we could see there was a pre-existing fracture region. Uh, that, that was the source of the cause of the fracture for the fan disc. This type of defect is called a hard alpha inclusion. And it's referred to as hard alpha because it's a very brittle and a very hard defect inside the material. Jim Wildy didn't understand why there should be a defect when there were several inspections of the disc during the manufacturing process. The titanium material is subject to a large number of inspections. Uh, during the manufacturing process, before they even make a part, the billets, these elongated ingots, are ultrasonically inspected. Unfortunately, if the uh, defect that you're looking for is right adjacent to the surface, the ultrasonic inspection isn't really capable of t detecting that type of anomaly. After extensive examination, the flaw in the rotor disc was found to be the size of a grain of sand. It had been sitting in the disc since it was manufactured 17 years before the day of the crash. It's, uh, it's a very surprising uh, realization that something as small as a very small grain of sand can bring down an airplane as big as a, a major transport aircraft. But uh, in, the, uh, in the knowledge of metallurgy and the knowledge of uh, rotating parts, uh, it, uh, it proved to be a possibility that uh, became a reality. The crash at Sioux City was the result of an extraordinary chain of events, a one in a billion chance. We have an adage in aviation safety that says that if you break any link in the chain, you've broken the accident. And the accident won't happen. But once that, once that, you know, if you, if you haven't broken this chain of events that start, in this case, the flaw in the disc, the flaw in the disc caused the disc to fail. The disc failure causes parts to fly to the engine. The parts fly to the engine, it punctures a horizontal stabilizer. When it does that, what are the odds of it hitting two hydraulic system lines? And it did that as well, and it punctured those too. It all happened in a quarter of a second, and it all started with that small defect in the, in the rotor disc. So it went from a rotor disc problem, to an engine problem, to a hydraulic problem, to a loss of control problem. Flight control, again, the trail goes right back to the little defect in the disc. 
Thankfully, crashes like Sioux City are rare occurrences. Flying is still statistically the safest way to travel. Quite frankly, the danger that I face every day when I go to work is between my driveway and the parking lot. More people are going to try to kill me between now here and O'Hare tomorrow in an air and a car. Once I'm upstairs, I'm among professionals. We play by the same rules, and we're out there doing the very best we can to be safe and to do it well and professionally. And I feel very, very safe upstairs. Statistically, emotionally, any way I want to look at it, I'd much rather be upstairs than down here on a safety issue. It's dangerous down here. <laughs>